Hey, everybody. Welcome. Great to have you. Thanks for being a part of Christ Community Chapel. Welcome those of you over in East Hall and those of you tuning in. Welcome. Man, it seems like it's been forever uh, since I've uh, spoken to you. And uh, that's my fault. And I'm sorry I let my calendar kind of get out of control the last couple of months. Uh, but I'm back and uh, I want you to know I, I uh, love this place, love you guys, and uh, hope, hope you still love me. So <laughs> that was a shameless pandering. Anyway, uh, last week I was in New York City listening to Tim Keller and Ravi Zacharias and uh, Michael Ramsden and Sam Albury. And uh, it was really rich and uh, thick. And I, it's going to take me a while to process uh, all that I learned. But once I process it and digest it, I promise I will um, regurgitate it on you. There's had to be a better way to say that. But <laughs> you're going to get what I learned, I promise. Um, but it was, it was a great, great week. And, and then uh, last weekend, while I was gone, Tom Randall was speaking, and uh, everybody always loves when Tom speaks. I love when Tom speaks, and so I listened to it, and he, and he pushed uh, this, uh, the Community Bible Experience, which, because he loves it, and I love it too. It's been great, and I hope you're involved, but last weekend, Tom said, if you're not involved, go buy one of the books, but when he did that, by Saturday night, early Sunday morning, all the books were gone. So then he said, just sign up. And then he started saying in second and third service, I'll buy the books for you, right? <laughs> so we had to order, listen, we had to order 400 more books. So, well, yeah, that's great. But sooner or later, Tom's going to realize you don't offer free stuff to this congregation, <laughs> right? But we have uh, almost 3,000 people reading through the New Testament. So if you haven't picked up a book, please do. You have nothing to lose. Tom's buying. So <laughs> that's good. All right. We have a theme for the year. It's called Know the Story. And the idea is simply this, that the Bible is more than just a collection of different stories. It's one overarching story of how God created the world and how the world was wrecked through sin and our rebellion. And now when I say our rebellion, what I mean is that every single one of us wants to be in charge of our own life. And if you think you don't want to be in charge of your own life, I want you to think back to the last time something went really wrong in your life, when your life went sideways. Did you look up at God and say, God, I know you love me, and I know you are wildly smart, so I will assume this is for my benefit, even though I can't imagine how, but I want to thank you for it. If you did that, then good for you. But most of us, when things go sideways in our lives, we look up at God and we say, really? What are you doing? Do you even know what you're doing? I don't think so. And it's that rebellion collectively that has wrecked our world. And it's that rebellion that has wrecked or is wrecking your life. But God. But God. And those are two of the greatest words in the whole Bible. Romans chapter 5. But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, while we were in rebellion against him, Christ died for us. So God didn't allow us in our rebellion to go off into the abyss, which he had every right to do, but instead he chased after us and pursued us by sending us his son, Jesus. And that's the overarching story. Well, I have a great story for you. I have uh, two friends, Matt and Emily. I met them probably a decade ago, and they were just out of college, and they wanted to be missionaries, but they wanted to go to a place where people had never heard the name Jesus. And they ended up in the remote, kind of the remotest part of Indonesia. We have to fly several planes, each one getting smaller, and then you have to get in a helicopter, and then you have to hike to get into what's called the Kora Valley with the Kora people. So Matt and Emily did that, and they built a hut with the Kora people, 
And for the next about six, almost seven years, they just lived with them, loved them, and tried to learn their language so they could tell them the story of God. And then the time came where it was, they were ready to tell the story, and it was going to take a couple of weeks because they were going to start in Genesis and tell the overarching story so that Jesus would be in context. And they wanted to get it right, so they uh, had a translator help them. And the translator was uh, a, a young man named Mirius. And Mirius was um, only about 10 when they first arrived, so he learned English much faster than they learned the Korah language. And so they were checking with Mirius to make sure that what they were saying was what they wanted to say. And they were building throughout, and they just got to Jesus. And they were talking to Mirius that night about the lessons that were coming up about Jesus. And Mirius said, what's going to happen to Jesus? And they said, you have to wait. Because they wanted everyone to hear it together because they didn't want it to leak out, you know, and come uh, in a wrong way. And Mirius said, okay, but I think he's going to die. And they were shocked. And they said, why do you say that? He said, I think they're going to kill him. And they're going to kill him because he has to pay for our sin. Just like the lamb had to pay for the sins of the people in the earlier story, Jesus is going to be our lamb. And they got to tell him about Jesus that night, Jesus' death and resurrection, and Mirius became the first follower of Jesus in the whole Korah Valley. All right? Isn't that cool? Now, <clears throat> what I, that's what I mean by the whole overarching story. That Mirius said, but I, we're right at the point in our theme for the year, we're going to introduce Jesus. And I want to use today to show you how what happened in the Korah Valley happened how Marius was able to connect the dots, why Matt and Emily even went to the Korah Valley, and how the people, the people's hearts were open because now there are dozens of followers of Jesus in the Korah Valley. How did all that happen? And this is how. So Jesus finally comes, and he spends 33 years living with the ordinary people of Judea and Galilee. In the last three years of his life, he begins to do things no one else had ever done. He begins to say things no one else had ever said. He loves and teaches in a way that is just astounding. And all the time he's telling people outrageous things about himself. And he keeps telling them that he is a savior who has come to save them, but he's going to have to die in order to do it. And he says that over and over again. And while Marius was able to connect the dots, the people of Jesus' time were not. And finally, Jesus is arrested, and he is convicted of blasphemy, which is claiming to be equal with God, and then he is crucified. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus is crucified, and three days later, he resurrects to prove that he really is who he said he, who he, said he is. And then he appeared to hundreds of people over the course of 40 days, just le less than six weeks, and then he left. And his leaving has a name. We call it the Ascension. And this is how it's put in, in the book of Acts. And this is cool because uh, almost all of you have read the book of Acts in the last week, which I love. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. It says, he, Jesus, presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. The story is told a little more fully in uh, Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 44. It says, then he, Jesus, said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. What Jesus is saying there is that there's an overarching story and it's all about me. It's always been about me. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things and behold, 
I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. All right. Now, after all the pain and all the teaching and the crucifixion and the resurrection, it seems like it was a pretty short victory lap for Jesus. Forty days is all he spent. Forty days of telling people, I told you so, and evangelizing, and then he left. Of course, the question is, why? Why did he leave, and what happened when he left? One of the things that's interesting is in John chapter 16, at the Last Supper, the night that Jesus was arrested, Jesus said something kind of cryptic to his disciples, something that they did not really believe to be true. Uh, it's John chapter 16, verse 7. And this is what he says. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Oh, Jesus is hinting that he's not going to be around forever. And then he says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. What Jesus says is, it's better, it's better this way. I'm going to leave, but it's even better for you that I go. And the disciples were just going, that cannot be true. It cannot be true. But Jesus, sure enough, is crucified, resurrected, and then he ascends. Let me read it in uh, Acts chapter 11, and then we'll get into the meat of this message. Acts chapter 11, verses or Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them over 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed in his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Okay, this is God's word. All right. <clears throat> When theologians call this the ascension, they're not just putting a name on how he left this planet. What they're connecting it to is like in a monarchy, when the true king comes into power, we say that he ascended to his throne. This is where that comes from. Jesus, the true king, ascends to his throne, and when he does, there is something cosmic that happens in heaven and something cosmic that happens on earth. In heaven, a debt is paid, and on earth, a gift is given. Let me start with heaven. But before that, let me talk about the parade. Uh, when the Cleveland Cavaliers won the NBA championship, you, you know they won, right? <laughs> um, yes, we are the NBA champions, the reigning NBA champions. Those of you who are tuning in online from another state, you may not know, but Cleveland, we're champions. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I need you to know, I have watched and rewatched the last three games of the Golden State Series an unhealthy number of times. <laughs> but this message is not about confession, it's about the ascension. So, <laughs> but after the Cavaliers did the improbable, did the impossible out in Golden State, they came back, and we had a ginormous parade here in Cleveland. 1.3 
million people lined the streets of Cleveland, hung over rooftops, pressed their faces against windows. Because somehow, when the Cleveland Cavaliers won, we won. Somehow, when they won, we won. And I want you to imagine what it must have been like in heaven when Jesus ascended and came into heaven. Again, I think the whole place exploded with joy and wonder. And the reason is because the glory of Jesus was magnified. Now get used to that word. That word magnified, because we're going to talk about it again, doesn't mean different. It means multiplied. It means kind of expanded. Uh, Not because Jesus was different, but because they saw something in him they had not seen before. I think the angels had no idea, no comprehension of the depth of Jesus' love, his willingness to sacrifice, and his power and authority. Because, when he, because what they saw was Jesus coming back and they saw that, that this universe that had been fractured by sin was going to be restored and the kingdom of God had come with power because their king had returned with authority. Right? That's the parade. And then this cosmic thing happened in heaven that a debt was paid because one of the things that scripture says that's interesting is one of the first things that Jesus does when he gets to heaven is he sits down and he doesn't sit down because he's tired there's something more significant going on let me use Hebrews to show you Hebrews chapter 10 verses 11 and 12 says this and every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. The reason this was written to the Hebrews is the Hebrew mind would understand this immediately. In the temple of God, where all the sacrifices were made before Jesus came, the sacrifices were made for sins. In the temple of God, there are no there's no place for a priest to sit. There are no benches, no chairs, no stools. There's no priest lounge where they can go get a cup of coffee. There's nothing. Because when you were a priest and you were on duty, you were constantly making sacrifices because people were constantly sinning and their sin needed to be covered. But this says when Jesus ascended, he sat down. And he sat down because there was no nothing else to do. And this is why. This is Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 14. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? What that says is when Jesus ascended, he brought to God a payment. And that payment was so precious and so valuable, and so abundant, it paid for every single sin. It paid for every sin you have ever committed or ever will commit. And that's why Jesus sat down, because there was nothing else to do. And when Jesus sat down, he fulfilled 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When Jesus sat down, he activated you to become a child of God, a son of God, a daughter of God. We became co-inheritors of all the riches of Christ when he sat down. Right? There are a ton of things that happened when Jesus ascended, when Jesus took his place at the right hand of God. But I just want you to remember this one because I want you to remember this message. That the cosmic thing that happened in heaven was a debt was paid. Your debt was paid. All right? 
The cosmic thing that happened on earth was a gift was given. A gift was given. In John chapter 16, Jesus is at the Last Supper with his disciples, and they're getting kind of squirrely because they know that something's up. And they keep thinking that Jesus is going to leave, and finally he says to them, yeah, you're right. I'm going to leave. And then he says, but if I leave, it will be even better because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And of course, the question is, how is that better? How is it better for us to have the Holy Spirit than to have Jesus in flesh and blood still walking the roads of our world? And the answer is that word magnified. Not different, multiplied, expanded, exploded. The first thing that is magnified is the very presence of Jesus. The presence of Jesus. When David Bennett was here two weeks ago, he talked about the Holy Spirit as the imminent presence of Jesus to us. That the, the Holy Spirit is so near, so close, he is actually inside of us. When Jesus walked this planet, he could only be one place at one time. So when Jesus walked away with Peter, James, and John, which he often did, the other nine disciples had to wait. And they were without Jesus till Jesus came back. But when Jesus ascended and he sent the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes inside of every follower of Jesus so you are never, ever alone for good and bad. And I say that for good and bad. For good, it's the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of your salvation. He reminds you that you are a child of God. He comforts you and gives you strength. Your possibility of love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness, those things are the fruit of the Spirit. He's the one who makes those true in your life. Right? So the Holy Spirit is the one who gives you the ability to preach the gospel to yourself. And oh, I hope you preach the gospel to yourself. I hope you wake up every morning and say to God, God, I know I'm not the person I want to be, should be, ought to be. But I also know this that you love me still. And you love me so much that you sent your son Jesus to die for me. And when he did, something cosmic happened in heaven that my debt was paid, but you've also given me the Holy Spirit. Be full in my life right now. And it's the Holy Spirit that drives that deeper and deeper into you. That's the good. The bad of the Holy Spirit is this, that every time you go your own way and you run away from God and you begin to sin, it's the Holy Spirit who does not let you go quickly or easily. It's the Holy Spirit who makes you miserable. The Holy Spirit causes what I, what I am going to, I'm calling spiritual indigestion, but it's stronger than that. The Holy Spirit will make you ache when you're away from God. Every once in a while, I'll meet somebody who, I, who, was a, who had, has professed to be a follower of Jesus, and they're far away from God, and they're miserable. And I always tell them that's a good sign. That means the Holy Spirit is not letting you go. That's his job, too, to convict you, to draw you back, and to draw you back even if it's in pain. All right? So this, the, the very presence of Jesus is magnified. Then when Jesus walked this earth, theologians are fond of saying that he fulfilled three roles. He was a prophet, priest, and king. Prophet, priest, and king. And each one of those roles is magnified when Jesus ascends. And let me show you. A prophet is someone who uh, speaks to people on behalf of God. If people are here and God is here, a prophet faces this way, and he hears from God and speaks to the people and gives people the word of God. When Jesus was here on earth, he was the greatest of all prophets. He was more than a prophet because he spoke directly as God to the people, but he was giving the word of God to people. And when Jesus ascended and sends the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit inspires this. He gives us this, the Bible, the New Testament, so that now we have the Word of God. And this is what that means. That means virtually in every continent, in every country in the world this weekend, someone who has the Spirit of God in them is taking the Word of God and giving it to the people of God with power, and Jesus is magnified. All right, that's prophet. Then it says that Jesus is priest. If a prophet is someone who brings God to people and stands between God and the people to give uh, the word of God to people, then a priest is somebody who stands between people and God and brings people to God. So a prophet faces this way, but a priest faces this way and brings the people 
as close as he possibly can to the presence of God. And Jesus did that when he walked the earth. But when he ascended, something happened. And this is what happened. This is Hebrews chapter 4. It says, um, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Since then we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has in every respect been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Then this verse. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in, fi- in time of need. What that says, if you, if you wonder why you are allowed to pray directly to God, to call him your father, this is why. Because Jesus ascended as the high priest. That's why you don't have to pray to a saint to get to God. That's why you don't have to come to me or someone like me and say, you pray for me because I can't go myself. No, if you know Jesus and he is your high priest, then you go directly to God. And and what the writer of Hebrews says is you go with confidence to the very throne because Jesus makes it so. So Jesus as priest brings you right into the very presence of God. And finally, the role of king. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, wise men from the east came bearing gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And they went to Herod, and they said to Herod, we are looking for the one who was born king. When Jesus began to teach, he began to tell people that the kingdom of God was come and that he was the one who was bringing it. And then when Jesus was crucified, he was crucified with a sign above his head that said, this is Jesus, king of of the Jews. In order to have a kingdom, you need three things. You need a king, you need subjects, someone to rule, and you need a domain, some place to rule. That's what you need for a kingdom. Every kingdom needs a king, subjects, and domain. Jesus, when he was talking about the kingdom of God, he said the kingdom of God is like a little bit of yeast that a woman puts in this huge lump of dough, and it begins to multiply and spread throughout the whole lump of dough. He said the kingdom of God was like a mustard seed. It's the tiniest of all seeds, but then it grows up and expands into this huge tree. The kingdom of God explodes like that. At the end of World War II, uh, China ended up expelling all the missionary, all the Christian missionaries and becoming communist. And they made it illegal to be a Christian in China. And at that time, the estimates were that, from missiologists, were there there are about 4 million Christians in that huge country of China, which is just a drop in the bucket. And everybody wondered what would happen when all the Christian missionaries were kicked out, and what would happen to Christianity in China when it became illegal to be a Christian. And now, missiologists estimate that there are between 100 million and 250 million Christians in China. By some estimates, China will, be, will soon become the country with the most Christians of any country in the entire world. You know why? Because the kingdom of God spreads. The kingdom of God is like yeast that works its way through the whole dough. And this is why. If Jesus ascends, and right after Jesus ascends, Christianity begins to break out into the Roman Empire. We're calling this series, The Story Goes Viral. The story goes viral. The reason that it goes viral is that every Christian is a carrier. Every one of us. We carry the gospel. It's not just ministers and professional clergy. It's all of us. And you carry the gospel into your neighborhood and into your family, into your workplace, into your school. Let me finish with this. I like like this. In Luke, uh, Jesus is talking about John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was a remarkable man of God, very powerful. But this is what Jesus says in Luke chapter 7, verse 28. He says, I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Let me say that again. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Uh, you may feel like you are a very weak Christian. 
(laughs) Somewhere in the world, there's the weakest, dumbest Christian. We may have them in our church. You may be it. And what Jesus says is you are greater than John the Baptist. And the reason he says that is because Jesus ascended. And when Jesus ascended, a debt was paid. Your debt was paid. And when Jesus ascended, a gift was given. The Holy Spirit is within you. And the Holy Spirit is the most powerful entity this world has ever known. And you carry in your heart and in your mind the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the antidote for the brokenness of this whole world. You're a carrier. Know the story. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for uh, your deep love for us. Thank you for sending your son uh, to die for us. Thank you, too, for the ascension and for sending the Holy Spirit to live within us. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would, would fill us with his fruit, with love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness. And I pray that we will be infected with the gospel in such a way that people will will ask us uh, what's different about us. And then we'll be able to share your story with them and your love with them. And I pray that your kingdom would spread. Thanks for your grace. Thanks for your son, our Savior. We pray this in his name. Amen.